number of different uh, kinds of news organizations. Um, and one of the things that we found was that about um, linking, just linking to different kinds of news and information was still pretty much a foreign concept. I'm gonna, I don't know why this is ringing, but I wanna, do you, are you guys hearing that? A little bit. All right. Uh, uh, linking was still pretty much a foreign concept at that time. We had um, three sites that didn't have any links to any kind of external site at all uh, in what we studied, and most that didn't have more than three. Uh, so that was sort of thinking about who, are, who am I going to actually put links to on my site. You can see the um, bright colors were a very clear uh, strategy and, and, and um, what was considered popular. Interactivity was rare. Uh, six of the sites that we studied, we studied 12 in all, and six had only one or two interactive elements, such as voting for a candidate. Two of the big things um, this year were taking a vote online, which was really usually a yes or a no vote, uh, or taking a survey about whether you liked something or, or you didn't like something, was the way of sort of connecting with users online. Sites varied in their interactivity of video, but we did have raw footage. Uh, which was already beginning to come in, where about half were offering sort of raw footage of speeches and other kinds of appearances of their candidates uh, on stage. So then we get to two, uh, 2000, uh, where we have, um, these are the web portals and legacy sites. So then we get to 2004, uh, John Kerry takes on uh, Bush. But we're at the point now where 60% of US adults are using the web and a quarter that are actually getting news online. But still, it's about 13% of Americans that are regularly getting election news from the web, which puts it on par with news magazines and with Sunday morning talk shows. Uh, we studied this, this year 10 political home pages uh, during the height of the primary season. And I would add that we were also still at a point where there's a lot of creation and um, uh, death <laughs> in, the, in the web in terms of uh, outlets that were coming and going. Four of the ones that we studied uh, the previous election cycle were long gone by the time we came back to this cycle to study. Um, but we did study um, 10 and found that they vary dramatically in the level of technological advancement that they used in the approach. A lot of them were cramming sort of 30 or more stories on the home page. So it was all about landing on the home page and you wanted to be able to give your audience everything they might want on that home page. So people were cramming all kinds of information, 30 or more stories um, right on that page. Um, a lot were still pasting the morning's newspaper story on the web. Uh, there wasn't a lot of development that occurred sort of after that initial news cycle was occurring. Uh, we found that organizations that were beginning to offer users more than just that daily news story. Uh, so we were starting to see links on their own sites to background information about the candidates, to their policy stances, to information on how to vote. Um, Six and ten contained, uh, still didn't contain any links to external news sites, though. So we still had this sense of a walled garden, of trying to keep somebody, once they came inside, uh, uh, we're certainly not going to send them off our site. I remember talking to um, what were then sort of the, the technology heads at news organizations at another um, conference that I was, I was giving a talk at in these years, and just the idea of offering somebody to go beyond your particular news site was really scary because your goal, your mission, and what you were told by your bosses was to bring people into the website. And if we lose, if we lose them, if we send them out, we'll never get them back. Uh, so there still wasn't a whole lot of linking that was occurring. Seven of the ten sites didn't have links to any external non-news sites like voter sites um, or anything like that. Uh, and uh, what we what we did have. Uh, in 2004 was um, certain kinds of development when it came to uh, uh, customization, static images, uh, use of different sort of uh, uh, static tools that people could sort of see what was happening. One of the really popular things was maps. Uh, you can see here, this was one of the ones on CNN, where they were, you, each time you went, you might get a slightly different image. So it didn't change while you were viewing it. But you can see the, um, this is basically the very early <laughs> stages of Google Maps. <laughs> you can see where the candidate had been traveling and where the candidate was um, by looking at this. One of the other really interesting ones that year was the Demo Derby that was on MSNBC's website, 
which had little bobbleheads on horses, and the bobbleheads, and then it was a race, and obviously each time you went, you'd see who was ahead and who was behind, and one day the four would be all, it would all be clustered together, and another day one would be ahead of the other. Um, but it was sort of the bobblehead derby of, of, of that year. Um, we did have Howard Dean that year that ushered in a new era by introducing blogs to the campaign website, and the novel idea that candidates would regularly speak directly uh, to supporters. Unfortunately, that did not get him into the Oval Office. Uh, that came the next election cycle in 2008, uh, Obama versus McCain. Uh, and here we had an election cycle that really was built around blogs, around the uh, sort of the introduction of social media, and engaging with the public. We had three quarters, so now a clear majority that were online. Um, but oh, just only about a quarter still that we're getting news about the election online, and less than a quarter that we're using social news media. Uh, we had a majority, about eight in 10, that had cell phones, but we had not even begun surveying about smartphones. So this idea of that device that was gonna be mobile with you and give you that information was still very much to come. Um, but we did have, in the primary season, all 19 um, presidential uh, candidates that had websites. So we at the Pew Research Center transitioned our study from uh, news deliverers to the campaigns themselves. And we studied the websites of the 19 primary candidates um, in May and June of 2007. And what we found too was, as I said, very much the rise of blogs, where Howard Dean had started in 2004 was really the rage in 2008. Um, 15 of the 19 had blogs on their site. Um, the four that didn't had something very similar, something like online forums, they just sort of didn't quite call them blogs, or they had outside blogs that they didn't really integrate into their site. Um, Romney's was done by his five sons, so there was also a lot of personalization in what people brought uh, uh, to these sites. All but two allowed user comments in. So there was a lot less control of the message uh, when you look at what was happening on the websites in particular in this election site. Um, and many of these sites also offered and encouraged users to start their own blogs associated with the campaign that could appear on the site as well. Um, so a lot of opportunities there for citizens, for the public to have a voice. Um, uh, here you can see some of what we were finding on, on uh, social media too, where 16 of the 19 candidate sites linked to at least one social networking site. Uh, MySpace at the time was the most popular for those of you that did any social media back then. We also had Flickr, uh, which was popular. We had Meetup. Uh, we had um, uh, Obama that had the greatest number of followers, uh, but it would pale. It, it's very small when you think about the number of followers that they have today. It's 400,000, um, which far surpassed uh, most of the others at the time, um, but does not compare. It's, it's, you know, it was triple of that of anybody else at the time. It really doesn't compare uh, to the kinds of followers that we have today. And you actually get John Edwards that surpassed all others in the primary season with 23 separate places for people to connect with him on his campaign that were listed on his website. We also had on the websites a lot, oops, sorry, a lot more ways for uh, users to join and to get information. 12 of the 19 sites help supporters organize community events. So the idea of taking your interest online and moving it offline to do more for the campaign. Eight that had tools for hosting fundraisers. Um, still, one of the tools that was the least offered uh, was telling people how to vote. Only four of the 19 actually had information about registering to vote that we could find on the websites. With YouTube's debut in 2005, video began to be have some more prominence. We had 17 and 19 that had video. A lot of them were TV channels. You had things like DTV, which was Chris Dodd's TV, um, MidTV, uh, and then you also had webcasts where if you clicked on something, you could see what that candidate was saying uh, about a particular issue. Um, in terms of citizen engagement, we, 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 we did see uh, sort of less control of the message overall uh, uh, in terms of that. We also found, though, that mainstream media still played a pretty prominent role. All but one still had in their news site, there were large
partially linking to uh, traditional news outlets and the reporting that those outlets were doing. Then we move to 2012, where you have about half, 80% um, uh, that are online and about 40% uh, that are getting news online. So we're still not at a point where you have a majority of the public that's getting news online, and it's still about a quarter that are getting news regularly online. Um, but with more digital activity, the campaigns were really ramping up the ways that, we're, that they were trying to use it. And so we focused this uh, study on the two nominees, and we did it in June of 2012, and found really substantial gaps in the use of technology, as well as a more controlled message overall, um, but with a pretty personal feel. So we found um, overall the Obama campaign um, this is something perhaps we'll talk about more uh, in our conversation, posted four times the content, and that was true both in the social media space and in the website space uh, as the Romney campaign, received twice the public response. And one of the areas where we saw the, most, the sort of blurry activity was on Twitter, where the Obama campaign averaged 29 tweets a day. That far surpasses what we're seeing this year in 2016 in terms of activity. Romney, uh, the Romney campaign um, put more emphasis on video and actually had more video than the Obama campaign, but neither of them had a ton, so it didn't really end up, you know, standing out a lot uh, in what they were in what they were producing. And it was a more controlled message. This was the year where the Obama campaign actually, in their news feed, was not linking to news articles. They were largely using um, their own press releases, their own content. Uh, that was sort of produced and controlled more by the campaign itself. We also found that yeah, though there were still blogs, there were no opportunities for users to create their own, own blogs. And about half of the digital posts, 40% of Romney's, were about domestic issues. So on the websites, though, the candidates really did delve into uh, issues and talked a lot about issues um, uh, overall. We also found, though, that one of the things that was really um, a part of this campaign uh, um, on both was the use of constituency groups, ways that people could both identify themselves, customize the information that they were getting, uh, and become a certain sort of cohort within support within a, being a supporter for that particular candidate. So in terms of, um, this is just showing all the different voter groups and constituency groups, whether you were somebody that cared about issues about women or veterans affairs or gun control or gun rights, you could sign up and sort of join and get your information customized around those particular issues. Um, we did also have a lot that was happening at the state level. And it wasn't just you being able to put information in, but also um, being able to get information and news that was customized to that particular area geographically that you were interested in. So a lot of the customization that was occurring. But you still only had about 3% of the tweets were at, that were retweeting citizens or somehow engaging with citizens. The Romney campaign only had one <laughs> retweet that was not uh, within the campaign, and that was um, uh, from his son. That was the only retweet that, that the campaign did and all the time that we studied. So then we get to 2016, uh, and we did a study that basically covered May and some of June, and it was for um, the Clinton campaign, the um, uh, also the Sanders campaign, and then the Trump campaign. And what comes out here again is a lot of differences uh, between the campaigns and what they're offering and the way that they're using and making, making use of technology to connect with, with citizens. And as I said, we are clearly at a point where a majority are getting news in the digital space. In a talk that I was doing earlier today, I really looked at the sort of the trajectory and the degree to which social media is really a huge driver of news and information today. Um, though television still does remain uh, the one that is utilized that has the greatest reach overall in the US. There's still a lot of people that are tied to that box. It's in the middle of their living room or their kitchen or wherever it may be. Um, but digital really is taking a primary place in terms of people's information flow. And we see this when we look at sort of the ways technology is being used. There is more emphasis in social media, which is changing the dynamics of the website and in some ways actually lessening the degree to which the public can engage uh, and, and take part 
um, through the digital space. Because social media, even though it's engaging with individuals, it's sort of meant to be at an individual level, there's not a whole lot of um, sort of specific touch points that the individual can make other than retweets or likes or you know whatever they can, or shares, or whatever the case may be there. Um, we found on the websites in particular that for all three, there are no constituency group signups. There are no voter voter groups. There's you can't sign up to say I care about veterans affairs. I care about um, women's issues. I, I, that, that's not a part of the dynamic on the web at all. The only one of those groups, there's no personal fundraising pages. The only one that still exists is at the state level. That you can identify yourself um, as being from a particular state uh, and and getting some information that's sort of script, uh, scripted to that. And the Sanders campaign was the only one that actually provided tools in the areas that we could study and, and, and find to take your support for offline activities. So they would supply scripted messages to do phone calls and things like that. Um, but that was not offered by the other campaigns. Uh, so we do see, oh, the other thing we see, though, is on the websites is huge differences in the news spaces, sort of the news channels. So Clinton campaign has two different uh, channels that are the, sort of the news sections, which almost entirely bypass uh, the news media itself. And instead are these very produced news stories, is what they look like, that have bylines. So you can't click on the byline and sort of find out who that individual is, but they're all named byline pieces, and incorporating graphics and photos and sometimes videos uh, into these stories. But they are like the native advertising kind of story, uh, native uh, uh, advertising news story that's appearing on the website, where it incorporates the Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton's views around a particular issue that this story is addressing. Uh, the Trump campaign, on the other hand, um, doesn't produce much original content at all uh, on the website, and instead, in their news sections, are linking to um, uh, news media, uh, and largely on the website, it's news media that's saying things that are are positive for the Trump campaign. And the Sanders campaign was somewhere in the middle, incorporating press releases, kind of more traditional press releases, along with um, along with some of the others. We also did know uh, notice that on the Clinton website in particular, there's a lot of um, a fair amount of Spanish translation that's occurring. So a lot of the stories that are produced are fully translated, um, including the graphics and the photos in um, the Spanish language and, and posted back. We see a lot of social media uh, differences as well. And a new survey that we did that we just released last week found that three in 10 US adults uh, went either directly to um, email, social media posts, or uh, websites for the Hillary Clinton campaign or Trump campaign to get information. So this is definitely a new dynamic, but at least the campaign serving as direct sources of news and information is you know certainly now touching a significant portion, three in ten uh, U.S. adults overall. So when we look at their social media, we again see a lot of differences. Relatively strong activity, but the three candidates tended to be pretty similar overall. Um, none of them came close to the 29 uh, uh, tweets per average for the Obama campaign. Um, uh, five to seven posts on Facebook, 11 to 12 on Twitter daily in the area time period that we study. Um, but we found in general that even though there are averages, we did see uh, the Trump campaign get far more response for the activity that that, uh, that campaign was putting out. And when it came to their approach, uh, again, we see when they're linking uh, to Facebook posts, Facebook posts that have links uh, in them, uh, very different uses of those links. The Trump campaign 78% of the time was linked to news media, either in a way that was critical or in a way that was saying, look at what somebody said that was good about me. The Clinton campaign, eight in 10 of those links were back to things that their own campaign put out. So very much about the controlled message uh, in terms of linking back to their campaign. And the Sanders campaign you see again here, uh, uh, pretty much falling in between the two uh, in how that campaign was using social media. We see it similar also when we look at uh, retweets. Uh, who or is each campaign tending to retweet? Again, not a ton. Only about two in 10 tweets that were retweets um, of any kind. But when they did retweet, the campaigns used that technique very differently. The Trump campaign, you can see, tended to retweet members of the general public, uh, citizens primarily, retweeting things that they were saying. The Clinton campaign, again, tended to retweet things that their campaign uh, themselves and the same
campaigners campaign a mix between news media and sometimes celebrities, uh, sometimes other kinds of, of individuals that were in there. And finally, when they're talking about each other. So a lot of what we get is how much of this is anti this and anti that and anti, you know, talking about the negativities of the opponent. Um, so what, you know, the biggest thing that stood out was for the most part, the conversation was occurring between Clinton and Trump. Uh, Sanders was not that much in the loop in terms of the references there. And finally, I'll just leave you with the fact that whether it's because of the, the multiplicity of sources and information that we have available, that the public has available to them, whether it's tied to the fact that we have this phone that we can't stand to put down for five minutes because we're worried about what we might have missed, um, we are at a point where even four months away, as we're just at the height of the, the nominating the two presidential candidates, we do already have six in ten Americans that say that they are worn out uh, by the amount of coverage that uh, they are receiving about the presidential campaign. Now, we'll dig into the conversation. So, um, with that, I want to get to our panel. We got we, what we did was we brought together a group of people who we thought could really talk.